Well, let's begin. Hi, everybody. My name is Kwabna Ansa, and I'm the Head of Communities and Research here at the Low Agency. I want to welcome you to the Low Agency's final webinar for 2021. Today, we have an amazing group of panellists joining us from across Australia to discuss community engagement, two years of learning. Joining me today will be my co-host from LOTS National Advisory Board, Sarah Yomez. Sarah? It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon on this wonderful webinar. My name is Sarah Yomez. I am the co-host along with Kavina. Um, I work as a Disability Royal Commission Advocate at the Multicultural Disability Advocacy Association. Uh, I've also got some experience working as an elected councillor for five years at Fairfield City Council, which is one of the most multicultural uh, cities in the whole of New South Wales. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all today uh, to listen to our wonderful and distinguished panellists and to get some insights into a very important topic. Thanks, Sarah. So today we have a group that I'm very proud of um, to welcome you on our final webinar. So um, with no ado, um, with no further ado, we've got Grace Edwards from the Refugee Health Network in Queensland. And Grace works with a, a range of community leaders um, across, across Queensland and has done an amazing job uh, over the last two years um, with the organisation. We also have Sunil Menon. Um, he is head of community at Melbourne City FC. Uh, Sunil works with young cold communities across the southeastern region of Melbourne. And then we've got Henrietta Podgoska from the Umbrella Multicultural Community Care Services Inc. in WA. Now, Henrietta, she works with senior cold communities um, specifically members from the European, Jewish and Chinese communities. So welcome guys. So why have we chosen this topic? So as the world in Australia begins to open back up, 2022 is looking to be the year that online community engagement will complement face-to-face -face engagement. It will mean practitioners move away from their desk over Zoom um, and put on their most comfortable shoes and get back out there to the town halls, the festivals, train stations, and to school engagement. So as we draw a line in the sand, the Low Agency has decided to end the year with learnings from these amazing practitioners from across the country and what they have learned and what the future holds for them in their engagement programs. So I'll pass it over to Sarah to open us up with the first question. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Kobina. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank everybody for sending through their questions. We've got a number of questions and hopefully we'll endeavour to go through all of those questions if time permits. Um, and during the course of the webinar, please feel free to ask any questions or make any comments in the chat section as well. Uh, this is a learning environment, so we're encouraging everybody to ask as many questions as they'd like to. Um, so to begin, uh, I'd like to ask Grace, Henrietta and Sunil, what has been your learning from the 2020 to 21 period in terms of community engagement? Well, we'll start with you, Sunil. Perfect. Yeah, I can go first. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Kobina. Um, really, really um, pleased to be here. Um, look, I think, you know, understanding it's a, it's a national audience that today and um, you know, being based, based in Melbourne and in Victoria for the last two years, uh, it's been really tough, uh, really, really tough for a lot of people. And um, I think the, the lockdowns and the, the continual sort of, um, I guess, the, the rollout around vaccines and the hesitancy around that. And um, yeah, that, that's been really disruptive for so many people and so many people's lives. Uh, for Melbourne City, uh, you know, we're obviously an A-League football club, the current champions of the A-League as well, A-League men's. Um, and uh, we've recently relocated to the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne uh, based at Casey Fields in, in Cranbourne. So um, from Bundura, where we were for, you know, over 10 years. So from the northern suburbs to the southeast. Um, and we actually moved in the middle of that last lockdown in, in around August. So it's been a really interesting time where we've moved to a new area, trying to work with different communities, um, meet new people, um, and doing all that online. So um, that's, been, that's been a really big challenge for the first sort of three or four months of that, uh, of that time. I think... What we've learned from that is, um, you know, online is tough. 
Uh, I think to be brutally honest, it, it's it's a tough environment. I think you know in that first lockdown in March 2020, online was kind of a bit of a novelty. It all seemed a bit of fun, you know, quizzes and trivia nights and all that sort of stuff. And we were all in it together. But I think you know you could see the visible um, wearing down of people through that process, and particularly young people who we work with and a part of our community programs here at Melbourne City. Um, so I think the, the, the online experience has been um, has been tough. Uh, I think what it has done though is uh, allowed some different things. So for us, uh, you know, we used to host online sessions um, during the week for our uh, with our players, and our players would meet some of our young leaders who are uh, part of our programs, help co-design and, and, and facilitate our programs. Um, it was an op opportunity for them to have half an hour in a week with a you know, professional footballer, uh, learn how they're going, um, uh, learn what their how their experience of lockdown has been, and. Um, a little bit of light in a, in, a, in, a, in a dark time where, you know, you, you get access to, to someone you don't really get to speak to all the time. Um, so I think online has obviously been a, a huge learning, but we've had some benefits from that as well. Um, you know, we've, we've moved a lot of our school programs online and that's actually allowed us to get to more schools with different things, which has been a, a huge positive. So rather than have, you know, a staff member driving from school to school across Melbourne, um, she's sort of at home delivering that program online for one school. That's an hour session done onto the next Zoom call, onto the next school. So um, not ideal, but it does allow us to see more people and allow us to talk more about who we are as the, the charitable arm of, of Melbourne City Football Club. Um, so um, advantages and disadvantages, but um, quite, quite, a, quite a taxing two years, I guess, on, on a lot of different people in a lot of different circumstances. I can imagine how that is, uh, Sunil, um, you know, the transition to a new way of life um, and every community has its own challenges. Um, were, were there any particular communities you were, that stood out or um, was it the same across the board? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think depending on the situations for people, it, that, that, that sort of dictated how they, how they felt and, and the timings and what was going on at the time. Um, I think, uh, I, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but um, specifically around vaccine and vac vaccination rollout, uh, the communication around that um, when trying to reach hard to reach communities we, became quite a challenge for government, quite a, quite a challenge for um, big communications agencies. And, and that's where, you know, those direct community connections um, that we had with different groups really started to pay off um, a lot more. So um, it's interesting, like, you know, you don't need those communities till you really need them. Um, and um, when, when people are, are desperate and you know want to get those numbers up and how do we get to this group and you know they're coming down to community level they're not you know mass blasting paid media or anything like that they're they're actually really coming down to the grassroots so I think um, that's that was probably the um, the part where we saw yeah real interesting called community engagement and different ways of approaching that. Thank you Sunil. Henrietta how has your experience been in terms of community engagement? Hi everyone, and I just would like to acknowledge the Vajak people of the Noongar Nation on which this um, I am at the moment and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. So as everybody know, I'm guessing we are a little bit different here in WA and our last lockdown was actually in April. Uh, so for us, obviously the journey, it was very different. However, the initial experience was very similar. And what I picked up was, is that lack of trust that the mainstream providers or government agencies had have not had with the ethnic groups and they not even tried in the first six weeks to do any translation. So a lot of the things fall back on the uh, uh, multicultural service providers and advocacy groups or the main groups to do that groundwork. And uh, finally, the government and all the other bodies realize that they do need to communicate. They can't get around that. Um, so that's when they start slowing up. But again, we were a little bit of an afterthought instead of first thing of we are a multicultural communities and we know that there are people who don't speak English well or need that communication in the own language and that wasn't really acknowledged but I would like to acknowledge for example in WA now when we have a lockdown or any transitional plan the, tw uh, the turnaround for translation for at least minimum 20 languages is 24 hours um, so I really would love to see that happening in other states if it's not already uh, the WA government was really doing well another thing was the communication bit so translation and interpreting is one thing but how are we sending that message and what I what we found is that digital literacy was um, really from a ten. It's literally we done ten years worth of digital literacy in six months. 
<laughs> and we left people behind. Um, and another thing that also happened is that the digital skills that people learn, especially seniors that I work with, was very disjoint. They still don't use, um, a, a, you know, a computer at home, uh, but they have their smartphone and taking photos and so forth. So uh, their ability to communicate really changed online. And you know, certain groups like the Chinese, it's WeChat. For the for the Polish, is a for Facebook group. So it's a very different uh, way. You, so you have to think of multiple ways of approaching different groups and not one fits all cookie cutter approach and that's not going to work. Yeah, so that was that was sort of what we learned from the last uh, two years. And next year, 5th of February, um, crunching time for WA because we're going to open up. So obviously for us, the plans are a little bit different than probably to the others. Thank you. Yeah, certainly, Henrietta. I mean, what you said is uh, certainly being felt among the communities in my area as well, just the lack of trust, the constant um, change to mandates, um, not understanding things on because of the, you know, translation not being done quick enough. Uh, it's certainly something that New South Wales really needs to continue to get a grasp on. Thank you for that. No worries. Um, Grace, how has your experiences been? Yeah, I think very similar to, to everything that uh, Sunil and Henrietta just said, but in terms, I guess, of the project, the biggest learnings we got out of 2020 in terms of working with um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities is that genuine communication and engagement needs to be two ways. Um, it can't be just from the top down, it has to be from the bottom up as well. Um, and um, and should change over time in response to the community and how different communities like what Henrietta said um, communicate and what um, social media platforms they use, whether it's word of mouth or whether it's face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, forms of communication or whether they need a video recorded in their language. Um, and I guess also finding um, what I like to call boundary spanners. So the people within each community group that will be your bridge to be able to engage or communicate in the best way with that community. Um, I think um, the uh, culturally and the, the, the project that we're working on here in Queensland has been um, fortunate in that we've been able to find those people and and um, work together with those people in a, in a sustainable way to support their communities. Um, and then also um, valuing the importance of um, um, and recognizing the importance of cultural contribution in, in, in this whole conversation about COVID-19 and, and communication about the vaccines is that there is knowledge within each community about what is the best way to go about sharing information of, or communicating. And um, it's not that these communities don't know how to do it, it's that the perhaps the ways in which um, services and or government is going about supporting them is not the right way. So valuing that and giving it a voice as well in this conversation um, and working with those people instead of serving um, all the time. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. They're fantastic points, actually. I think, um, you know, cultural contribution is very important, particularly when it comes to misconceptions or fears about the vaccine, which is something I've seen a lot um, in various cultural communities. Thank you very much. Um, I will now pass on to my co-host, Quabina, for the next question. Thanks, Sarah. So um, to the panellists, and we'll start with Henrietta first. Uh, the second question is, as a professional, how have communities engaged with you? So taking into account the varying um, degrees of um, what the pandemic has, um, you know, uh, led to, but also I think Henrietta, from your perspective, what has WA, um, how have your communities um, engaged with you differently out in WA? Obviously, we don't have restrictions. And although the beginning was difficult, um, in the last one year, sort of everybody settled back into their normal, um, you know, we had huge event. We have a Diwali that was 10,000 people. Uh, you know, it's huge event and in Perth. So a lot of the ethnic communities went back to the way and that was encouraged, you know, um, we removed all the restrictions and it's quite a safe bubble here. Um, but at the same time, I also can see that um, the preparation for the 5th of February um, that's why I'm a little bit concerned about this very 
uh, you know, it's literally not even a, like a month and a half uh, we have to get uh, ethnic groups ready and they do big events. So some of the restrictions are going to get impacted on them, how they're going to deal with it, how they are implementing safe WA plan uh, and making sure that they can continue, um, you know, probably in a scaled down version. Even my events, I can't really do any um, workshops and I do a lot of workshops around dementia, about aged care, about just generally about on different languages. Um, and I can't hold it anymore in our office because we all the vac because of the vaccine mandate, I have to find an alternative one. So we slowly, I think we slowly going back into that, um, thinking that what we had a year and a half ago when we have to be more cautious about where we're doing things, how we are doing things. Um, and the ethnic groups are really great. They engaged with a lot of the they were always open to do something. Um, I'm not sure it's just because the way that umbrella works or because of our networks. But if I say, hey guys, we have dementia workshop and it's amazing. Um, I had I have a lot of people put up their hands and they wanted to do it. Uh, not just the old ones, but the young ones because they understand they need to prepare for it. So there's um, a lot of uh, community, a lot of programs happening in the community. So um, we are a little bit anxiety, I think, and cautiousness is coming back into the conversations. And I can see that people like, Henny, let's see what's happening after February. So it's like a, it was a huge stop from yesterday. Um, so it's very interesting to have this panel discussion now because when we first done this, I was like, it's all good here, guys. What are you talking about? And now it's like 5th of February. At the crunch time. So yes, definitely that anxiousness came back to communication. Well, that, that's quite interesting. I'll, I'll pass it over to Sunil and maybe you can talk about social anxiety um, that you've seen over the last two years in the in the hard reach, uh, hard to reach communities in your response. Thanks, Sunil. Yeah, cheers. Um, so I think, yeah, a little bit different from the Republic of Western Australia in, here in Melbourne. Um, it's been a, it's been a big challenge, and I think you know, we, particularly with young people, and, and when you consider the young people that we work with, um, that um, help design our programs and run our programs, uh, that attend our programs, that um, assist us on match days um, to help run A League matches at Amy Park, um, yeah, these are really sporty, active um, people who, um, you know, their whole sort of day to day life is around being outdoors, being active, and, and being healthy. Um, when all of a sudden you're, you're locked in your house and you can't leave them within five kilometres, that's a huge change for for, um, for a young person to sort of you know get that get up to speed with that and what does that mean and how does that affect my my future and what does that look like and then I think when you add on top of that the, the complexities around uh, language difficulties or barriers and communication around that it's um, it's a whole sort of melting pot of, of different issues there. Um, what we try to do, um, I guess. In, in some ways, um, I don't like to sort of concede or concede defeat, but you knew your programs are not going to be what they are. So, and you, you just, you have no control over that, unfortunately. Uh, so you can, only, you can only work with what you've got. And um, we sort of made two really conscious decisions. One was, um, you know, what can we do online and how can we do that? Um, short, sharp and snappy, conscious that people, uh, particularly uh, school age and, and tertiary age uh, young people are probably going to be online for school all day or at least four or five hours. So what can we do that's fun, exciting, uh, can we, you know, play games online? Can we have players on? Can we have other inspirational speakers that they can speak to? Um, so that was definitely one approach. Um, the other one was was trying to look at uh, how we as a club um, support uh, the vaccine rollout. So uh, in our home in Casey Fields, we had a pop up clinic there for uh, for a weekend a few a few months ago. Now uh, we had our captain speaking to to news cameras and, and encouraging the community to come down. Uh, our head coach Patrick Kisnobo, Kisnobo did the same thing. Um, and another local pop-up site in Dandenong. Um, so we, we just tried to support those government messages as best we could, uh, knowing that, of course, you know, that's all everyone was concerned about um, in, here in Melbourne and in most parts of the country was rolling out that, um, that vaccine and making sure those messages were clear and then how we support different community groups with that as well. So some really great um, local providers here in Melbourne, um, Centre for Multicultural Youth, uh, Selen and a few others were doing some great work around vaccine um, initiatives and, and we'd encourage groups to, to, to go sort of speak to them as they had the expertise around languages and, um, and community leaders who could, who could then influence that message further as well. Um, similar to what uh, Henrietta was saying um, around you know, closed Facebook groups and things like that, that's where the misinformation we found was spreading the most. Um, so if we could sort of you know, pull some of those young people that we had, push them towards those um, those providers we mentioned earlier, that, was, that seemed to be the, the easiest approach in, 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 um, in helping roll out. 
Fantastic. Um, now, Grace, um, I'll repeat the question. As a professional, how have communities engaged with you? And I know you work um, extensively across cold communities in um, Queensland. So um, something I'd like you to add into your response that we got off someone, um, a question that came in, how do you inspire and invigorate members to participate, volunteer and engage um, in some of the programs that you were looking to do? Mm. Um, to answer that question simply, I think it's trust. Um, that's the biggest thing is um, if, if the community or communities you're working with don't really trust you, then um, there's nothing else that can become of, of that engagement that you are trying to um, do with them. Um, so trust is the biggest thing. And I think in Queensland, we, we had a really challenging beginning to, to the pandemic in that um, a lot of the racial connotations that were put on this pandemic from the beginning for, for us here with um, the three young ladies from um, African backgrounds um, traveling from Melbourne to here um, without declaring that um, they were coming from Melbourne and the way in which the media um, he has spun that story and plastering their faces on the Korea Mail, their home address is being revealed, um, where their family lived, all of that. I think that caused a lot of distrust between um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, specifically African communities, um, with the government, the health system, because no one knew who was the who was the one leaking that information to the media or how the media got hold of that information. Um, so a lot of trust building had, had to happen um, at the start. And you know, COVID-19 has highlighted a lot of in inequities that were already there well, within our health system before, but they were just um, put on a pressure cooker pretty much um, during the pandemic. Um, and that doesn't help at all when a service then comes in and tries to support a community with information or translations or whatnot if the community doesn't trust the health system anymore and um, so a lot of trust building had to happen and um, that trust building was pretty much led by community leaders speaking up um, in, speaking up about the lack of translations. At the beginning of the pandemic, Queensland was only translating to 15 languages. Now we're up to 38 um, and a lot faster. The 24 hour turnaround is now happening here as well. So that is um, to do with a lot of advocacy work from community leaders, formal and informal, who are raising their voices and saying, we need more, we need more information, we need to know what this thing is, we need to be able to support our communities with information. And that is how this project was was born, the project that I'm working on now. And without them raising their voices and, and putting their hands up and coming to say, we want to work with you to support our communities, um, I don't know where the project will be or if we would have made as big an impact as we have now. Fantastic. Um, can, can I just add? Yeah, yeah, for sure, Sunil. Yeah, yeah, to what Grace said around the, the health inequities around it um, is spot on. And I think further to that is also the financial inequities. And you know, when you consider, um, you know, larger families um, and larger uh, larger groups, um, if there's, you know, let's say there's four children in a household, but only one laptop, you know, how does schooling happen in an online environment? That's really, really difficult. And um, that's something we found a lot with our groups that we we're working with. And um, yeah, that, that, you know, the, the, the untold effects of the pandemic around mental health of young people and, and physical activity of, of all people really, but specifically young people in this instance, I think it's going to be um, something we're all going to learn a lot more about in the, in the coming years. And um, I guess it's on us for in, in, who are working in this space to be aware and, and, and be ready for that. And um, I know Victor the Victorian government's got a, a really large focus on mental health in the coming years. And I think that'll be sort of that almost a second pandemic of sorts. Um, and, and hopefully we've, you know, we're prepared for something like that. Hey, Sarah. So um, I'll go to my next question. Uh, it's in relation to some projects. So as we know, the last 12 months has been quite difficult for a lot of our child communities. Um, what projects have you done in the last 12 months that you would consider to be successful? And I guess um, when you think about that, there's also a question that came through one of our audience members saying, uh, how do we inspire and invigorate member participation, volunteering and engagement? Uh, so I'll put that to the floor. I'll start with um, Grace, because I do remember you mentioning um, a, a particular project. 
Um, yes, yeah, so before I started working on the Cal COVID-19 Health Engagement Project, I was um, working with the Refugee Health Network again, but on a different project for health literacy. Um, and that was about sharing information on how to navigate um, the Australian health system for um, new and arriving migrant and or refugee communities in Queensland. Um, and the way in which we um, engage in, with communities on that is that the Refugee Health Health Network has a consultancy group called the G11. Um, they're a group of 11 um, um, cultural uh, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, who um, are advocates for health within their community and also a few work within the health system um, and they've been supporting their own communities within their own capacity with information for a while but um, for the past eight years um, the network has been us upskilling them in peer research and, and other areas to be able to continue the work they're doing um, and um, to pay them for their time as consultants as well and, and give them that training to develop their skills further. Um, so we work with that group to identify key issues or concerns, health concerns within um, different communities, um, like for instance, diabetes or uh, mental health or um, just going in and doing a workshop on the differences between private and public health care, what is a Medicare, stuff like that. Um, and um, seeing that when we went in, when a concern was identified by the community that they actually wanted more information on, more people tended to, to come because we were um, responding to a need identified by the community rather than coming in and saying, we want to teach you this, but that's not really the thing that is of concern or the thing that the community wants information on. Um, and I think that um, the learnings from that project has really um, helped me with, with this current project, the COVID-19 project, and that it's about listening to the community need, asking questions and, and responding to that um, to the best of your ability with the resources that you have. Um, and also um, working together with different networks to share information um, and not trying to come in and reinvent the wheel, but work with whatever um, forms of communication are already there or whatever structures are already in place within a community. That's fantastic, Ray. So I guess um, identifying what that community need is and really going out there to speak to them about that need and uh, that kind of inspires them or encourages them to be part of that. Yes, it does. It encourages them to be part of that. And once you form that first positive um, um, engagement activity, they'll be more inclined to come to more workshops or, um, or you can even add more information to the back of, you know, the information that they really want to hear about. Um, so, for instance, we've been running um, COVID-19 vaccine information sessions with a, um, a slide deck um, developed, co-developed by Queensland Health and the project based off of questions from community about the vaccines. And mm -hmm. when we go into community, we do a consultation first about what are the key things you want to know about the vaccines, because it is a 70 page PowerPoint presentation um, and you don't want to have people sitting there for hours on end listening to the whole thing. So um, it, the best thing to do is to consult with a member with the member of that community who you who is the boundary spanner between you and that community and identifying what key messages or what key pieces of information um, they want clarity on in terms of the vaccines, um, and then going in and starting off with sharing that information and then also taking questions because there's always, um, time for questions is always good. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Grace. Henrietta, what kind of projects do you think have been successful um, and what do you think as an organization we can do to encourage more volunteers and participation? Um, so one of our very successful projects was actually called Let's Get Social. It came out of um, from the findings from the city councils when they done the welfare calls in the initial 12 weeks that we had the big lockdown, that cult seniors are especially vulnerable and they're not connecting and they're afraid to leave the house and they're not getting the right information. So they literally came to us because Umbrella provides um, community-based HK services and one of our biggest operations is social support. Now, 20 years 
years ago when the Polish community established Umbera, they knew that the members are more resource intensive and the mainstream services that were provided at the time were not suitable for often more resource intensive, you know, with the language and the culture. So they came together and, um, you know, established Umbrella. But even then they knew it's not cleaning or gardening that's going to keep people well at home uh, long term, um, but it's the connections to the self, culture and language. So what happened with Umbrella at the 12 months, the clients who were attending our social groups were extremely well connected. None of them reported any social isolation. In fact, they were calling each other on Tuesdays because that was the day when they meant to call. So they done like a huge call conference. That was incredible to see, um, you know, and we come up with some ideas to make sure that they can connect to each other and keep connected. So we wanted to, we went, the government said, you know, the city council said this was the problem. And we said, look, we think we have a solution but with umbrella because we have to have the assessment from the government it takes some time we said look give us some funding let us show what is missing in the, these communities and how we can bring people together just by giving them a bus and the person to organize activities now i sent out 10 emails and i never had this one before and anybody who does community engagement or development when you send you send out 50 emails and two people respond i had sent out 10 emails and i had 10 people plus one came back and said yes we have a senior group that really decimated by the pandemic and we would love to see this happening so um, I didn't get more funding from the Department of Communities that initially funded this so we just run with three groups um, one Eastern European and one Japanese um, and it was extremely successful um, you know um, they because we were providing that transport one of the biggest barriers for seniors as well as for young people because they don't have the mean but for seniors as well because they lose the ability to drive they're not comfortable driving to places they don't know so what we done we removed that um, the transport barrier and we removed the language barrier to a full-on activity and until today I have not lost one participant in fact I gained I had to upgrade the bus into a 21 seater um, so we just showed that that extra um, effort into the community by an organization um, you know with providing the right settings they can actually really enable seniors to connect and come together um, and they also we put them through the friends in need program so what we try to do instead of the government or the organization trying to be everything to everybody we're trying to strengthen and empower the seniors to recognize when their friends and loved ones have any issues in, in the head or mind, in the heart, you know, as mentor her for being anxiety or in their pockets or financially. So we show them what could happen, what kind of conversation they can have and where they can go and also what kind of devices or information line they can use in order to access those information. And that was extremely successful. So we're trying to not just provide them with entertainment, which of course can be provided, but also providing, empowering them. So if lockdown happens, when the 5th of February comes, uh, they can actually look after each other and actually can, um, you know, flag us as well if there's any issue, but strengthening that community approach. And that was one of the very successful projects that we have done. That, that's fantastic. I mean, I know when the lockdowns were occurring, there, there was a lot of talk about the depression rates increasing and people calling lifelines. So I think these are extremely important initiatives. Thank you, Henrietta. Uh, Sunil, um, how has it been in terms of Melbourne and the projects that you've been doing, particularly around, around uh, young leaders and stakeholders? Yeah, look, I'm um, hearing from Grace and, and Henrietta around the, the depth and breadth of the work they're doing. Yeah, you know, makes me really jealous, if I'm honest, just in terms of you know, what we haven't been able to do, um, uh, especially in that four-month lockdown recently. Um, look, I, I think I might flip this a little bit and say, look, you know, what we've seen post-lockdown, and it's obviously a shorter time period, but um, interesting observations. A couple of things come to mind. Um, the first is, and, and Henrietta mentioned this before, and, and um, the, it, it's a really good point, Transport and just that basic, such a basic thing. But what we found particularly, like you know, when, when we have programs sort of out in the community and, and doing things with young people and it requires them to maybe go somewhere after school or do something after school, doesn't really happen. It's a bit too hard. It feels a little bit too, too much of a stretch. If we're based at the school and we're just having a kick and a structured session, um, a bit of fun, a bit of fruit or something, some food, food always gets people there. Um, that's always that engagement and, and they come in numbers, in massive numbers, because they know it's safe, a safe environment. It's just, you know, the, the oval at school, uh, it creates a really safe environment and it creates a really um, 
a, a trust. It's a, a place of trust because it's a school, right? And, and and parents are obviously more comfortable with that as well in, in, um, in their, their children attending that session. Um, in looking into the future, one thing we're looking to do is, uh, I guess, like the rest of the rest of Melbourne and, and Sydney to an extent, is make up for lost time. So we run a um, uh, um, a yearly young leaders session where it's kind of like an intake for the year, where we, we get everyone together, uh, run through a few days of training around um, football skills and, and coaching courses, uh, talk to senior leaders at the club from head coach to captain to CEO, um, and find out what those opportunities are for those people, those young people to be a part of the club into the future. Uh, we traditionally do that in sort of uh, suburban venues and things like that. Um, and what we're looking to do next year is actually do that at Amy Park um, Stadium in, in Melbourne. So, um, you know, we want to take people, young people, particularly those from those um, called backgrounds um, who don't necessarily get the chance to get out to those kind of venues all the time. We can put a bus on for them um, from the southeastern suburbs and um, and get them in there for that, that few days and really, you know, get them to a game, get them into a stadium, take them behind the scenes on a match day um, like I said, really trying to make up for, for lost time, but also trying to inspire that, that next generation who, um, who have missed out a little bit in this, in this time period. Certainly, Neil, I think that's extremely important and what you're doing is really good because um, I know that a lot of the younger cohort are the ones that were going into the social isolation and um, suffering depression, particularly in New South Wales, that I know when I had a look at the statistics, so it's something um, extremely, extremely important that New South Wales can also follow. Thank you for that. Um, another question I'd like to ask the panel is, uh, what are some of the key learnings from the demographics that you're dealing with? So from your Cal communities, uh, people with disabilities and takeaways that you have learnt from people with these backgrounds, what is something that has either inspired you or, have, or has come to your attention throughout this period? Um, I'll start with you, Sunil. Um, yeah, I think um, in terms of what we've what we've sort of it was it what we've learned sorry or was it what we've um uh, yeah so some of the key yeah, learning yeah, 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 from sure. the south communities yeah sure um i think it's been it's been a really interesting exercise in in the sense that um you know at the end of the day it's come back to direct community engagement and you know the greatest communications plan with a whole bunch of media spend behind it still hasn't reached some of those communities so that that shows a, a huge problem um that we've um, just been coasting through, you know, pre-COVID and COVID's kind of exposed that um, to, to say, hang on, you've actually got to really, you know, be engaging with these groups regularly. You can't just call them when you need them. Like there's got to be regular touch points here. And um, I think that's been a real um, interesting wake up call for a lot of different um, governments and uh, comms agencies and things like that. Um, but on the flip side, what that does also show is the value of, of this work and how important it is and how important face-to-face -face contact is and something we, we've definitely missed here as well. Um, the other learning would be from, from the core group's perspective would be, um, you know, no over communication. I think it, it is really, really important as well. Um, you know, you, you might, you, you know, you have different materials you need done, you have different things you need done, but um, trying to just trying to engage with them regularly on a regular basis through this time period uh, in the lockdowns was, was really tough. Uh, but I think that was really important as well because you need to see how people were going and, you know, so there are some days people just be like, I just can't talk to you today, Sunil. I've just, just yeah. had enough and it's, it's too much and uh, I need a day off. Like, that, that's totally, totally fine. So I think that that's important to respect that and acknowledge that as well. Um, and then I think also the, the, what we found is um, you know, people, from, particularly those from, um, from migrant backgrounds, so keen to get home and connect with people um, in their homelands and, and, and how and you know, when they realised the vaccine was the way to do that, um, that, that sort of made that process a little bit easier as well. So I think... Um, yeah, really, really tough, really tough for a lot of different groups for different reasons. But I think at the end of the day, that that um, overall communication and just you know, keeping in, in, in contact with people, keeping an eye on people, uh, mm -hmm. looking after your neighbours, so to speak, is, um, is the key. Thank you for those insights, Sunil. Um, Grace, what has been some of your learnings uh, with the CALD community over the past year? Yeah, so many, so many. I think that um, just to mention a few is that every every cultural group, every cultural community um, is different and has different strengths, different issues, different ways they want to move forward. And across all of them, I've learned that communities are very resilient in so many ways. Um, that they often have the capabilities and potential to lead on um, responding to COVID. 
and that services and service providers perhaps at times need to reflect on what role is best for them to take in supporting um, resilience in communities. Um, I think that sometimes service providers need to focus on the serving rather than more than the providing um, so that communities can um, become more sustainable in supporting themselves. So I think it's great to offer that support at the beginning and be the provider at the beginning, but you need to build um, those skills and do the community development aspect of it as well, so that in the future, those communities um, are strong enough and um, able to support themselves. Um, and that engagement sometimes should be more dialogical um, as it goes along. Um, so that communities become more resilient and their capabilities increase. Um, so if our engagement does not reflect on this, um, we may become out of step with community needs and their wishes. Um, yeah, those are my reflections. Excellent reflections. Thank you, Grace. Um, Henrietta, what has been some of your um, key findings in terms of your communities? Um, well, just to point on Sunil's point, there's not just over communication, but also over consultation uh, with not much result. Um, and I think I've seen a pushback from the communities is like you're listening to us or else. And I like that, that finally we're stepping up to that, that it's just running uh, merry goes around consultations is not working. And I've seen amazing leaders emerging from ethnic communities and it gives me goosebumps because I think it's fantastic. Other thing I've seen is the massive resilience that our elders have. We should not underestimate how resilient our elders are. They went through some pretty difficult times. The elders that I work with, especially the European backgrounds, came from refugee backgrounds of the second and World War and the communism, they've seen some stuff. So we actually relied an umbrella a lot on their experience on these issues because none of us been in any lockdown or any global issue like this. So they actually give us a lot of um, a lot of strength and, and the wisdom and inspiration. So we shouldn't just label them as vulnerable. They're actually quite a powerhouse of wisdom when it comes to doing these kind of things. Another thing, uh, and the last one was translation and interpreting. Um, I'm really glad that we started moving a little bit from tokenistic, do we need to do this to, you know, this is actually an important tool in communication, but I still feel that there's a lot of tick boxing happening. Um, I'm, um, you know, for example, um, happen estate or national, um, you know, consultations are happening. And then my first question is, how many languages are you going to translate that survey to? And when I hear three, four, five, um, I'm, my heart breaks because then I know that first their people who should be their voice should be here they're not going to and second of all it's going to fall back on me and umbrella and you know on uh, Sunil and on Grace to actually do the work and we are not getting paid for this I would love to see especially when it comes to translation interpreting which is a tool it's not the answer to communication it's a tool in a communication toolkit to be a bit more taken seriously and have minimum language number requirements for consultation for state and, and federal governments. 20 for state, 50 for government, and they must do that. Otherwise, we are going to keep having these battles with translation and interpreting. And we saw that the practical failure and the story, Sunia, but in Victoria become very infamous about the, um, uh, you know, initial, the second time when they use Google Translate to translate the information to those people in the tower should not happen ever. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Henrietta. And, um, Certainly what you said about, you know, the translation being a tool in communication, it certainly does empower our communities and that's something extremely important. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, I'll pass on to my co-host, Kwebena, for the next question. No problems. Look, we've had some questions in the chat from people. So um, I'll, I'll ask this question, but I'll start it off first. And this is for everyone within here. So can someone share a really effective ice um, breaker activity you used online? So um, over the last few years, uh, because we work in a multicultural community, um, a multicultural company, I've basically asked people, um, name a country in South America. And it gets people thinking. It gets people thinking. So let's start with you, Grace. Um, I, this one was actually shared with me um, in another group. I'm in a, a youth disability 
um, collective that I'm a part of. Um, and it uses a bit of technology. So we, we have a WhatsApp group as well with, with, with that. And basically the question was to describe your favorite television show, a movie or a book um, in emojis. So we had to then put the emojis into our WhatsApp chat group and then guess what each other's favorite thing is. That's Found great. it really fun. <laughs> Got uh, me thinking. That's so good. Uh, Sunil? Um, a little bit different, but one thing we found unbelievably effective in an online sense was um, categories. So people love okay. categories. They went <laughs> bananas. Like we, we would, we'd have a, like allocated 10 minutes online to our session. 40 minutes later, we got, right, this is the last one, guys. We're going to wrap up. <laughs> so but can you explain it? What, what, what? Yeah, yeah, sure. So categories is essentially, uh, it's a board game, which is obviously online as well. Um, for those who don't know. So essentially you get um, a letter uh, randomly, you roll the dice or press, press it online. Um, and then it's, it spits out different things that you need to name. So you can say, the letter could be, uh, for example, could be L and you could say, um, uh, I don't know, uh, things with lines on them, uh, things at the beach, uh, places you go to, London, that sort of stuff. So um, when you make it a bit competitive with young people, um, <laughs> Yeah, becomes pretty popular pretty quickly. Fantastic. Sarah, what have you? Um, I've actually uh, started with trivia with a few of my meetings that I've had online. Um, it's easy to do. It's easy to set up. Um, there's a website where you can do it for free. And a lot of people absolutely love it. So pretty much what you've done, Quebina, but in a more visual sense. Fantastic. And Henrietta, do you want to round us up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss the time with me. We didn't have much of the webinars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys were having face to face. You were having face to face. We get it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just moving out of the picture. <laughs> we, we just completely get it. Uh, so sorry, guys. Look. Not from me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, look, our last question before we wrap up, and I guess this is more future thinking. Um, and and you know, Sarah, you can also um, provide input with your um, with what you're doing in your community. So what does the future look like? And thinking about this, um, we've had a question come in um, from, um, from a participant. Thinking about what the future holds, how do you increase your reach and messaging into all communities without the big dollars? So how does the future look like? But obviously knowing you have a constrained budget. So I'll start off with Henrietta. Um, what I've seen in the communities, and I think this is really great, because yes, you're right, budgets are very strained and how we can go forward. What I've seen in the communities is actually, uh, especially non-for-profits are realizing this and either partnering up. So for example, currently in WA, there's um, the Office of Multicultural Interest, which I'm pretty sure there is equal to other states, just put out first time $100,000 non-recurrent funding uh, for a stream. And it's only for cultural and linguistically diverse communities. So good on Office of Multicultural Interest. I just wanted to say that. But I know it because it's only for service providers like Umbrella, we need to make sure, or other cult providers need to make sure they partner up. So I think it's partnership as well as looking at free for service. Accumulated knowledge and experience just on this panel about our ethnic groups is in, it's invaluable. And we shouldn't give things just for free. You know? For each other, that's a different, we always go and wanna share and wanna do, you know, that's why I love your agency as well. But for outside, for the mainstream, we need to look at how our experience and knowledge actually valued because um, especially with the over consultation, you can see that it's not really valued because yes, we go and, you know, pour our hearts out and then I do the same thing five years later, it's a little bit tiring. So maybe we should actually put our feet down and say no. So these are the things and because that's how we can go and make sure that we get quality outcomes for our community. Fantastic. Sarah, I'll bring you in. On yeah. this one. 
Um, so in terms of the not-for-profit I work for, the Multicultural Disability Advocacy Association, we had a number of consultations um, over the phone as well about um, what our consumers would like to see more of or have assistance with. And a lot of them indicated that they wanted assistance with technology. Um, given uh, throughout the whole COVID period, um, we couldn't really meet face-to-face. -face. There was a lot of um, reliance on technology. And some of our consumers wanted to know um, how to use technology, whether it's Facebook, Instagram. So uh, we got together with, we, we did, we partnered up. So what Henrietta said um, with uh, particular organisations, we got a grant for a project called Media for More. And in that project, you have um, staff members buddy up, whether it's online or um, face to face. So when the restrictions started to ease, um, we've done that so that we can teach uh, a lot of our consumers um, how to log in to Facebook, how to create a page. Um, how to go on Facebook and, and look at the MDA website to see what activities are on. Uh, so that's some of the stuff that we've been doing because we see that the future is going to involve a lot of reliance on technology. And it's certainly something that our consumers told us uh, they wanted more assistance with. So partnering up, um, applying for those grants. During COVID, there were several grants um, that were up for grabs for not-for-profits. And we, we really did take advantage of that. We've applied for um, as many as we could. Um, and we've got a lot of seminars through those grants that we've um, been able to carry out in relation to vaccination misconceptions, in relation to um, what COVID-19 uh, restrictions look like, what they mean for different communities, um, and basically telling them what services are available out there during lockdown. I mean, a lot of them don't know what phone services are available. A lot of them don't know what to do during that uh, particular instance. So um, I think partnerships, um, grants, um, online seminars, um, more training in technology uh, is the future. Fantastic. Uh, Sunil? Yeah, um, no, spot on. The, the first two have, have nailed it, I think, in terms of the partnerships and the grants. The only thing I, I would say to expand on that is I think what COVID's done is really force us to think about, okay, what do we actually do? Who are we? What do we do? Really, let's drill down into this a little bit more. So for us, we're the charitable arm of, of the Melbourne City Football Club. Um, football is our key to engaging with people. It's the biggest, biggest sport and the, the one that's played the most in the country. Um, we, the region that we're in now is, is really key. Um, it's a high migrant region, um, high migrant population. And then understanding that, you know, we've got the football side and we've got the, um, the opportunity for young people to come in and experience what that looks like from a young leader's perspective. We've got the programs that we've run, uh, which are all obviously, you know, uh, for, for free as well. So really drilling down into what exactly what that is. And then on top of that, um, I'd say, you know, sort of separate to that would be looking at how multicultural communities are involved in every conversation. It's not just tokenistically, you know, you're having groups, you know, pop up here and there that are, that are part of uh, some kind of photo up for photo up for MPs or things like that, but genuine actual engagement, identifying who community leaders are, who really moves the dial, who can really get things happening for you. Um, and knowing that in advance, not scrambling, you know, when there's 2000 cases a day and you know, vaccination rate of 50%, how do we reach this group? What do we do now? It's it's that that's known. Um, those groups are established and and a, a well rounded part of society as well. No, excellent. Um, and Grace, um, to finish us off, what does the future look like for the work you do and um, Queensland in general? Thank you. Mm, um, well, our borders just opened yesterday, so might be looking it's great but might be looking a bit bleak who knows we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks um so the future the future looks like living with covid and making sure that everyone their family friends whoever is prepared for what that comes with um whether it's um giving them enough information um about the hotline so that they know who to call especially now that we're going into the holiday season and a lot of services will be closing down and people will be going on break. Um, how can um, families continue to support themselves um, when the service that they go to is shut over the holidays? So it's, it's thinking about a lot of that and, and preparing for um, to give people support over the holidays that um, they can still have. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that with, with the project is we throughout we've been building um, networks on a WhatsApp 
um, chat group that is a one-way form of communication. So um, the press conferences, the COVID-19 press conferences in Queensland are the one um, way that a lot of information reaches a lot of people. And sometimes those press conferences are not accessible, especially to our culturally and linguistically diverse communities because of language. Um, so what we've been doing for a couple of months now is um, summarizing those press conferences in plain English and including direct links to where to find vaccine clinics, where to find testing clinics and what hotlines to call if you need more information um, and reminding people that a, a, an interpreter is your right and no one can, can deny you um, um, the use of an interpreter. So um, we share that. And then the people who we've been adding to that um, WhatsApp group over time who are community leaders, members, um, share that message on with their own communities, whether they translate it in audio form and share it to their community WhatsApp group or however way um, they go about sharing that, whether it's calling a, a community member of theirs that they know and giving them that message. Um, and in terms of how to um, increase reach, I think that was your other question earlier, it's to collaborate and to work together. I mean, we, with this project, we wouldn't have achieved um, the amount of work we have if we weren't partnering with other organizations. So we have three community service organizations and, and two um, healthcare organizations, including the Refugee Health Network and, and Queensland Government and Multicultural Affairs also attached to this project. So so it's, um, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's work that's done together in collaboration and partnership with, with so many different um, organizations and so many different community groups, community leaders. That's why, that's why it's been um, as um, great as it is because we're working together, not working individually. And I think also Sunil, what Sunil said earlier about identifying what it is that your service actually does what is what does it actually provide deliver for people and focusing on that as your niche and partnering with another organization or working in collaboration with another organization that also has a niche but something different that you don't do or can't reach will get you much further than trying to do everything at once it has been a pleasure hearing from all three of you and even you, Sarah, um, you know, the future is bright um, across all your organisations and even low uh, next year, we have the ability to do face to face um, engagement, um, Henrietta. <laughs> so we'll be going out um, with our clients starting in February um, doing face to face um, researching engagement, but I think um, from everything you've said, um, there are a lot of learnings for people to um, take. Um, and I think even you guys have learned a few things as well. I know I, sure, uh, I have as well, but I just wanna again, thank you from Loat um, for your expertise and your professionalism. Um, what you guys are doing in your respective states is um, amazing. And for the cold communities across Australia, um, your, you guys, you know, are doing amazing work. So I just want to say um, to everyone out there who's working with cold communities or working with communities in general, uh, your work it doesn't go unappreciated. It is um, it is work that is needed um, on a daily basis um, and reaching hard to um, hard communities it, it isn't hard. It's really just, you know, um, getting out there and um, being at the forefront of them. So. Um, just so everyone is aware, uh, Loat will be taking a bit of a break um, from the 23rd of December to 11th of January. We want to make sure that, um, you know, the team comes back fresh um, and ready for 2022. Uh, so from all of us, uh, have an amazing holiday period and um, ensure that you spend it with um, people that you care about as well. So any final words from our panellists? No, just a big thank you. Felt like um, two years of therapy of COVID and looking to, looking towards the future now. So, no, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank Nicely you. put, Sunil. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, 
Thank you, thank you so much for both of you um, leading this panel and also my fellow panelists. It was fantastic conversation. And uh, for us listening to what's happening in the East is going to come through soon. Uh, so hopefully we can learn each other. That was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate um, the panel for telling us all of your insights and giving us ideas as well. I'm certainly going to implement a lot of them in my organisation and I hope that you have a wonderful holiday season and then Happy New Year. And I look forward to catching up with all of you and, and to future sessions in 2022. Hopefully the situation for COVID will improve then. I'm a bit hopeful. Hmm. On that note, <laughs> see you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.